so this was joint work, uh, based on joint work with Yuri and Igor. Um, and yeah, I'm going to tell you how I worked on um, letting Appalachia reason about um, arbitrary temporal properties. So let's get started. So what, uh, okay. so what even is Appalachia? So you might have already caught Yuri's talk this morning. And if not, Appalachia is sort of an alternative model checker for um, TLA. Um, in contrast to TL, uh, so TLC, you might know, is an explicit state model checker. Um, Appalachia is a symbolic state model checker. So we take, we take our specification, and instead of going through all, the tr through all the states explicitly, we transform it into constraints, and then we pass those constraints to an SMT solver, for example, Z3. Um, it also, so this is in connection to the first point, it can symbolically reason about infinite state spaces. So for example, TLC might have a hard time going, um, doing something like this, where we just choose the amount in the natural numbers, um, and Appalachia can do it quite naturally. Um, and then one, um, one thing to pay attention to is that um, Appalachia reasons about bounded executions. So for example, th something you can verify is there's no invariant vi violation in the first 50 steps. Um, um, so Appalachia also adds types and type checking to TLA+. So type checking you can do by doing type OK um, in standard TLA+, but Appalachia allows you to specify in the spec already your, your types, um, just like that. Um, so it has been success successfully used to verify Tendermint, which is one consensus algorithm for blockchains, and it's also used by other users to verify all kinds of distributed algorithms. Um, so Appalachia is developed in, at informal systems. Um, the team is lots of, lots of great people. Um, so to mention is Igor, um, who uh, together with Yuri um, started or founded, let's say, Appalachia. Um, and Yuri, you're going to hear, uh, you already heard one talk from him and you're going to hear another talk later. Um, if you're interested in taking a look at Appalachia, there is, uh, under this page, you can find some the releases, some manual tutorials, example specifications with type annotations, and so on. Okay, so Appalachia is good for um, safety properties, but it lacks support, proper support for liveness. So, for example, you can state state invariance. So, for example, the some balances ne never go negative, right? Um, this is a property that only cares about the current state. And then you can also verify action invariance. So, for example, in, from one round to the next the token supply is increased by 200. So this just reasons about two consecutive states, so that's, that's fine, Appalachia can handle it. And Appalachia also supports something very powerful, which is called trace invariance. So here you have the trace given as sort of the, the history, and you can argue about arbitrary um, properties on this trace. So for example, this here says the um, number of tokens in the last state of the trace is twice the number of tokens in the first state of the trace. So this is very powerful. Um, but what about liveness? So on, at first glance, none of these look like liveness. State invariants only reason about one state. Action invariants reason about two consecutive states. And trace invariants allow you to, to reason about the trace, but they look a little bit weird. Um, so actually, these trace invariants, they're enough to express liveness, but they're a little hard to write. So to prove my point, um, so this property just says eventually we will have at least two tokens, right? And written as a, um, with the eventually operator, it looks very standard. But written as a trace invariant, it gets a little more complicated. You have to specify that there exists some step in the domain, so in the, um, over the length of your trace, such that at that point in time in the trace, you have at least two tokens. Um, so the goal is to also have the, these properties supported natively in Appalachia, right? To just support this eventually operator, which is not currently supported. Um, so this is the sort of broad overview of my talk. Um, I'll show you how to transform liveness properties into safety properties. Um, and in Appalachia, it's implemented as the following. You, you get your spec that has some temporal properties, right? It can be liveness, but it essentially it's just a spec that uses globally and eventually operators. Um, and you put it into Appalachia. Appalachia will perform some pre-processing, and it'll um, it'll give you a spec with some invariance that in particular does not have like temporal properties, temporal operators anymore. It, it just talks about safety. Then you can do model checking on this and then you get a result that refers to, that will tell you whether your original um, spec 
satisfied your temporal, uh, your temporal property. Okay, so this, this is very powerful as it allows us to essentially talk about liveness without, uh, by just solving safety problems. Okay, so what can you get out of this talk? Uh, why should you listen to me? So first, I'll going to I'm going to show you what counterexamples to liveness even are and how we can use that to transform liveness properties into safety properties. And I'm going to, to in, on the way, talk about some techniques that are um, quite powerful to apply sort of techniques that are for LTL in the context of TLA+, where you need to do a few things differently by using something called history and prophecy variables, which might be helpful for you for the, um, because they're very powerful and allow you to express things in sort of surprising ways. Okay, so what I'll show you is mostly based on this paper um, by Armin Bier and others. Um, it's already, so from, it's from 2006, so these techniques are not new. They're just new in the context of Appalachia. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a very toy example because I think the concepts are going to be a little bit easier to, um, to, uh, to explain on the simple example. And I'm going to just talk about some traffic light where essentially you have the light itself. It can be either red or green. And you have a button which can either be pressed or not. And if the button is pressed, then you request that that light should change to green now. So just the state, we have just these three states. So here, you, um, the light is green, here the light is red, and here the light is red, but you've pushed the button and you're now waiting for the light to turn green, okay? And I'm going to just um, illustrate my techniques on this small example here. So um, to specify the traffic light, you just need to know that we use two variables, um, one variable that tells us whether the, green, whether the light is green or red, and one that tells us whether the button has been pushed. And if the button has been pushed, then this variable is true. Um, and then let's look at a very simple liveness property, which just says eventually the, um, the light should be green. And so now what does a violation to this liveness property here look like? What does a trace need to look like that violates this? So we, you might think that a trace like this, we start at the state here, and then we have some path that never satisfies is green. You might think that this already violates the liveness property, but of course it doesn't because this trace, it may just go on and you might in the future at some point, uh, you might in the future at some point find that the light becomes green, right? So this doesn't yet, this doesn't yet violate the property. When it does start violating the property is when you look at a lasso like this, right? So you never see the light be green and then you finish a loop and you still never see the light be green. Um, so the small caveat, that this only holds for finite state systems, but essentially the counterexamples to liveness properties look like lassos. They have some, some straight line part and then they, then they close a loop. And then what we need to do essentially to transform liveness properties into safety properties is to encode traces with lassos in TLA+. Um, so the condition for, so essentially the hard, the, the hard part is to specify the loop, right? We want that the first state on the loop is equal to the last state on the loop, therefore we close the loop. So we can kind of sort of easily do this by just remembering the first state of the loop, which are by what I call history variables, right? These store the, the state at some point in the history. And then later on you can refer to that and you can ensure that your states are the same. So. Um, we're going to have one variable that's called in loop. It tells you whether you're on the loop or not, right? Whether you're even trying to finish a loop or not. And then you store the state of is green and requested green at the start of the loop. And then later on, you will refer back to that. And then how do we know when to start a loop? We can just guess it. So um, this formula, I'm, um, I'm going to try to briefly explain it. So you just non-deterministically choose your next value for in loop prime. If you're on the loop already, you should stay on the loop. It would be weird if you sort of, um, if you get out of the loop and then continue your execution by, by not being in the loop. Um, and then when you start the loop, this just tells you to save the value of is green and requested green in these variables. Um, and then how do we know, so we know how to start the loop and now how do we end the loop well, it's just that the first state of the loop should be equal to the current state, and then that closes the loop. 
So we just, um, so sort of this, uh, in similar to uh, type OK, this loop OK tells us, well, we're in the loop, and the stored values for the variables, so the, um, whatever I remembered at the start of the loop for whether my light is green or not should be, should match whether the light is green or not right now. Um, and then similar for whether, I, whether I've pushed the button or not. Um, okay, so that is sort of the, the rough idea of how we can, um, of how we find traces that have some form of loop. But we have one additional constraint, which is that our loops should be, our loops should also be counterexample, right? So we don't want to find any old loop. We want to find a loop that is a counterexample to the, um, to the liveness property. So recall the liveness property is eventually the light is green. So we need to find a lasso that has um, that never sees is green. And we can achieve this by adding some, by adding again another additional variable. So um, this variable is, is uh, looks a little bit fishy. This is um, the eventually operator here. It's not an operator in, in, um, in the TLA plus code. This is just the name of the variable, the whole thing. And this is just to, because the, um, the semantics of this variable is going to be exactly to be true when, at the current point in time, the formula here is satisfied, and to be false when, at the current point in time, the formula is not satisfied. Yeah. I suppose the, the variable satisfied eventually is green is not something that gets shown to the user, right? It's completely hidden from the user? Um, Sort of, so these variables, they can actually be helpful for the user to understand what their, what, why their, why the trace they get back is a counterexample. So the user, so the user, uh, sorry, the user doesn't have to put this in the code. This no, is no, generated no, no, automatically. Sure. Sure. No, I was just confused about the symbol here, right? The, ah, uh, the diamond would probably mess up the syntax. Yeah, okay, so. yes. Um, yeah, you're right. This is not like this in the, okay. in the, the code. Um, Essentially, you can imagine that there is a variable that has some unintelligible name, and then there's a comment that tells us what this variable stands for, and that's how you get both something that you can run and something that the user can look at and see what's happening. Okay, um, thanks for the question. Uh, all right, so this variable, um, this variable satisfied eventually is green. It's sort of a variable that promises us future behavior. It, it makes assertions about the future of our trace. So that's why I call the prophecy variable. This is an, according to some um, nomenclature by Leslie Lamport. Um, it's a similar concept. So this variable tells you something about how the trace is going to behave in the future. And how do you do this? You guess some value initially for this variable. And then you only allow traces that match your guess. So, for example, um, let's have a look at this trace here. Um, so, sorry. Okay, at which point in the trace here is eventually is green satisfied? So, if we start out, if we start out here, for the first state here we see green, so then it should be satisfied. Here, the next state's green, so it should be satisfied, um, and so on. So, for example, um, in, in this state here, we need to know that in the future there's going to be a green state once, once more, otherwise we should set it to false. Um, and then here, we sort of will, will magically know that in the run from now on, we will never see a green state again. Um, Right, so this variable sort of behaves as if it knew the future of the run, which obviously, at a certain point in the run, it cannot. It can only see the past, but the future has yet to be discovered. Um, still, this is quite easy in TLA+. So if we take a look here, um, we're going to, again, non-deterministically choose the value of this variable. And then we're going to, something that, in, um, something that doesn't even look like an action, um, we're going to say that the current value of this variable um, satisfied eventually is green. Should be well, it should be true if right now it's green, 
or if in the future this property is this, um, satisfied eventually is green is satisfied, right? So essentially we're saying we're going to eventually see C is green if it's true right now, or we're going to see it eventually when we're in the next state. And this really sort of highlights the power of TLA plus, that something that, um, this certainly is not something that you can, that you could easily um, sort of express in your favorite programming language to say that um, you're going to relate the current and the future behavior of this variable together in this way. But in TLA plus it's, it's quite easy. Okay. Um, but it's a little bit harder in the context of Appalachia because Appalachia has some special behaviors that disallow introducing double primes to variables, right? Um, so, for example, you could have some property. So, do I have an example? Um, no, okay, I don't. So, for example, you could um, inside, so because this can be some arbitrary TLA plus expression, right? Your liveness property could talk about primed variables. Um, and then if you double prime here, Appalachia does not like that. Um, okay, so, yeah. Um, so you can, you can solve this problem by just adding another promise variable. So I already introduced the concept. Yeah, sorry. Um, since you mentioned double priming and double priming not being allowed because of refinement, uh, have you applied this technique to specifications that involve refinement? Um, no. So, um, okay. <laughs> um, okay, right. So getting around the problem of sort of um, dub the double priming, you just get another variable that similar to what the satisfied eventually is green already does, it's going to promise you the, vo the value in the next step of your of satisfied eventually is green, right? And this is quite easy to see how you, how you would do that, right? You, in the next state, you check that the value, the value um, of this variable you see matches whatever, you, whatever your satisfied eventually is green variable does. Um, so that's the so that's way you can get around any double priming, and you just need this extra variable. Okay, and one thing to complicate this a little bit again is that you're talking, of, of course, uh, not about some traces that go on forever without looping. You need to you encode traces with a loop, otherwise you don't find counterexamples. So um, in this trace here, which states satisfy um, this variable? So which states satisfy eventually is green? Um, in this case, it should be all, all the states. Okay, so for the first states, for the first states here, it's quite clear, right? There's, a, there's this green here. And then for these states here, well, the loop loops around here, so they will in the future, again, see a green state. Um, so the promise variable, so recall that sort of um, this is the second to last trace of your uh, state of your trace. The last state needs to match the first state of the loop. So now you need to, so now your, um, the promise variables in this state here need to de depend on the values of the promise variables in the first state of the loop. So they need to sort of roll over. Um, and you can do this in a similar way to how we already store the, um, the status of the, the system variables in the first state of the loop. In a similar manner, we store the values of these promise variables in the first state of the loop, right? So we have a variable that tells us at the start of the loop, satisfied eventually is green, was true or not. And then in this state, when we try to end the loop, we're going to ensure that these match up with what we saved. Okay. Um, right, so to sort of summarize the, this, this, first, this first part here, um, prophecy variables plus having a way to encode that you have a loop, um, are enough to encode temporal properties. They're enough to um, transform temporal properties into um, just straight safety properties. So you say, so the final condition, the final invariant, the final safety property you want to check is that, well, 
in the first state, because remember, temporal properties, they reason about, they tell you the value, is this formula true in the very first state of my, of my trace? Um, so eventually, is green should be true in the very first state of the trace? Um, if and only if your variable satisfied eventually is green is true in the very first state of your trace, right? So a trace is bad if it doesn't satisfy, if this, this prophecy variable is set to false, and if you can close a loop while keeping the promises of all your prophecy, vari prophecy variables. Um, so the, the actual liveness property then just looks like this here, where you say, well, um, okay, this, this, so um, note that this is another variable. You need to introduce lots of variables. I'm going to get on that in a second. So you say that initially um, your variable satisfied eventually is green, was false, and you found an okay loop. You found something that you can close the loop, and then that, um, and then that will violate your, um, your temporal property. So um, this part here just tells us that initially, even initially um, our formula doesn't hold, and then the other part tells us that we could close this loop. Okay, and then you can, um, you can sort of see that this variable here, it depends only on the current, the current um, the current value of that variable, right? We don't, we take the value of that variable at the very start and then we never change it, right? So this sort of cheats our way to reasoning about the first state when we're actually talking about the current state. And then this loop, okay, it's also easy to see, the, uh, it's sort of easy to imagine that this also just depends on the very current state, thanks to these many promise and history variables. Um, and you can still reason about the whole trace even though you're only talking about the current state. Okay, um, and then I've shown you this on a very simple property, but I want to show it to you on a little bit of more complex property as well. So here you have something very standard. Um, you have globally, you want, if you see requested green, then eventually you should see is green, right? Um, so this is very standard, this could be Globally, if you request something, then eventually you get a response, a very common pattern in distributed systems. And the, um, the syntax tree of this looks something like that, where here you have the globally operator, right? So here it's globally, your property, and then you have requested green implies eventually is green, and so on. Um, and how do we encode something that's more complicated? How do we encode something like this? It's going to take some more variables. Essentially, each of, if you, if you look at this, each of these nodes here depends on the future. These two nodes here, the requested green and is green, these nodes don't care about the future. They actually only care about the current state. However, the other ones, to know whether this eventually is green is satisfied, you need to know the future of the run. And then, because of that, to, to know whether requested green implies eventually is green is satisfied, it also depends on the future. So you need, prophecy, you need multiple prophecy variables for each of these nodes. Um, okay, so let's look at this in action. Um, because I'm not quite brave enough to run the tool right now, I have a screen recording instead. Um, right, so, um, so I run here um, Apalachee. I tell it next is stuttering. Next is going to hint towards what's going to happen already. Um, and then I have this eventually property, this property I've shown you as, as liveness on the slides before. Um, and I'm going to run it here. Okay. Um, and then I get a violation. Um, and I get some counterexample for this violation. And why, do, why does the property not hold? So, oops. Okay, so recall that the, um, so that what, that's what the stuttering hinted to. Um, my, the system I have looks, something, looks somewhat like this, right? Where in each of these states, I can just stay forever, right? So eventually is green, 
won't hold because what if what if the light never switches like what if never someone um, hits the button and requests that the green light comes on or what if someone does but the the, the traffic light just decides to be a jerk and never switch to green um, so if I sort of fix this this flaw um, right and I instead take the um, the next operator without stuttering. Um, right, so now I just use the next operator, um, I just specify next as next, no stuttering. Essentially, this corresponds to the traffic light where each step has to make process, a uh, progress. Oops, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> no? And we're, yep, then we're going to see here that, well, after 10, which is the um, default number of, um, of steps, that Apple, the, the default depth that Appalachian model checks to, um, we're not going to find a violation, and then I'm going to get no error. Yep. Uh, could, I, could we look at the specification that you generate, or is this already in some internal format for Appalachian? Um, the one with the additional variables or the prophecy variables. Yeah, so that's one of the advantages of this way of doing it, that the Im intermediate specification, it's a normal TLA plus right. specification. You can, you can plug that into TLC and yeah. model check this. Do I actually, it? I Do tried it. Sorry? Yeah. Do you have it with you? Uh, we can take a look at, at uh, it afterwards. Cool. Sure. Yeah. Um, right, but yeah, to... I will gladly get on that point because this is one of the nice things that this intermediate specification you generate, you can model check it with TLC, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, so it, it's not um, just the first step needs to be inside Appalachian. The other steps can be done by some other tool if you prefer. Um, all right, so. Right to the to, yeah so to the right here this is now the um, the traffic light that I checked right so where you don't have these stuttering arcs and then obviously if you if in each step you need to make progress inevitably you're going to see the light turn to green so um, the much nicer traffic light for pedestrians right okay <laughs> okay. Um, Right, so I've mentioned that the encoding needs lots of extra variables. So I've mentioned we need two extra variables here, two extra variables there at every slide in the presentation. So now the question is how many extra variables do we actually need? Um, so, okay, I've shown you these two properties. So liveness is just eventually is green, and then complex liveness is, well, um, this um, globally requested green implies eventually is green. In the original specification, we just have two variables, right? We just have two, the variable for is, the, is, it, um, is it green and has the button pushed, has green been, been requested? And then for this, um, for this simple property, you need 10 variables. For this more complicated pro property, you need 16 variables, just to give some, some perspective. Um, but, so this, this looks like a lot, and it is, but at least for Appalachian, these extra variables cause essentially almost no slowdown. Um, the extra variables are not what makes things more, what makes things run slower. What does, in fact, make things run slower are the symbolic transitions. So how many transitions does Appalachian extract from your specification? This essentially introduces, um, if you recall Euris talk from before, this introduces non-determinism in each step. And more non-determinism is a much bigger state space that, or is much harder for Appalachian to explore. Um, and this encoding, it doubles the number of symbolic transitions. And what's nice is that this doesn't matter which property you look at. No matter how complicated your property is, the symbolic transitions will, will just double. And um, the, the intuition behind that is, well, you have all the, the symbolic transitions that you had in the original, but you also can start the loop or not in each step. And then that's why your transitions double. Essentially, everything but, um, everything but starting the loop 
is sort of deterministic. You just have things that talk about the future, things that talk about the past, but there's no choice involved. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so for what this does in actual runtime, um, it's hard to compare because the or naturally we can't compare the, the, the runtime on the original spec to the runtime on the spec with the with the this encoding, because on the original spec we couldn't e we we couldn't sort of write this property right. So there is not really a nice comparison point. But in, since it doubles the number of symbolic transitions, you can expect some slowdown if you have an app if you run Apalachi on a spec on the safety property, and run it on the liveness property. The liveness property is going to be harder to check essentially. Okay, so. Um, I also considered some alternatives to this encoding. There are some. So, for example, you can encode your temporal properties as something called Bushi automata. So, it looks like this funny automaton, um, where this A and B, these are essentially your, um, your your state. So, this would this could, for example, say is green, not requested green, something like that. And it's nice because this needs very few extra variables. You don't need to talk about any prophecy and history and nothing. Because you can just encode the current state you're in as a single integer, and then you're done. That's all. And it's also okay to visualize, right? You can you could draw the automaton and you can in each state, in each um, in each state of your trace, you can visualize in which state of my automaton am I. So that's quite natural. But of course, um, this automaton, it doesn't always look as cute as this one. These may be very large, or these may be non-deterministic. And non-determinism also really kills Apalachi. As I mentioned, the symbolic transitions are very, are what makes Apalachi slow. And if we have non-determinism, then we're going to be very slow. Um, so yeah, you have many extra symbolic transitions. And also, uh, this is easy to visualize, but is it easy to understand? Probably not, especially for people who aren't who aren't uh, educated in logics and automata. It's not the easiest representation to understand. Um, another alternative is to use something that I've shown you before. So you can translate temporal properties into trace invariants. So, for example, things like this, right? Where, yeah, that's the example I gave you before. You can talk about certain steps inside the trace. And of course, this allows you to talk about any sort of temporal properties, um, because, well, you have the whole history of your trace, so just check whatever you want to check on your trace, and then it's okay. Um, this is very straightforward to translate. You don't, need these, you don't need to go through all these loops of encoding, trace, of encoding um, lassos in your run. Um, and you need essentially no extra variables. Depending on what you do, you might want one extra variable to represent some things more concisely. But essentially, you can use your spec as is. This can be a bit slower, though, because now you need to reason about something that concerns the whole trace. Apalachi needs to essentially unpack the, the whole trace, needs to reason about things that you could have left packed, essentially. Um, and the traces can be very difficult to understand, because one thing that's hidden about the um, encoding I've shown you is if you look at the trace, and Marcus, you alluded to that, um, if you look at the trace, these extra variables, you can take a look at them and you can see in this state, am I going to see, um, am I going to witness this property in the future or not? And this helps also um, sort of more easily understand without having to go through the whole trace and then figure out, oh, here is green is false, so now I need to, so now I understand why this property doesn't hold in this first state. You can take a look and see, oh, after this point, my property stops holding, therefore it must not have held in the first state. Um, all right. Yeah, exactly. So it helps. So in this case, it's a little bit harder to understand why your property was was violated, versus if you have all of these extra variables that tell you something about the future and past behavior. Looking at the trace is actually quite quite easy. Okay. Um, right. So one. Okay. One, okay. Good on time. Um, right. So one thing that's also um, to keep in mind is that. Apalachi, as I told you, is a symbolic bounded model checker. So you only reason about traces of some finite length. So for example, uh, the, the example I mentioned, there is no invariant violation in the first 50 steps. 
what does this even mean for the for this this liveness for, for this liveness encoding now? What are the first fifty steps? Um, so we have this we have our our execution with a loop, um, and the size of these two things combined, right? The size of your what I call handle and the size of your loop, they need to be smaller than the bound. So for so if you have something like this, that there's no invariant violation in the first fifty steps, now. It says something like there's no counterexample lasso of size at most 50. Um, right, so that's uh, one thing to keep in mind. The size can be a little bit counterintuitive. Um, okay, and now to the the last hurdle that we have to take. One thing that's pretty important for many temporal properties is um, is fairness, right? You want to say um, if, this, if the next action is weak fair, then I want to see eventually is green. So why is this even complicated? Isn't this straightforward? Well, not quite. Um, okay, so sorry, I'm going the wrong order. So to handle, uh, to handle fairness property, uh, to handle like, these fairness constraints, weak fairness, um, don't, you don't need to worry about exactly what happens here, but just know that fairness can be rewritten to just use enabled this enabled predicate. That's the formal definition of fairness. So what really I mean by talking about fairness is talking about enabled. Um, and Apalachi doesn't support fairness nor enabled, which previously wasn't really a problem because Apalachi didn't reason about these temporal properties out of the box anyways. So for safety, you have no problem. Um, however, for these more complicated temporal properties, you need to do something to support them. Um, and then one, one um, way forward would be to in adjust the Apalachi internals. Adjust whatever generates transitions to behave in a fair manner. But the Apalachi internals are sort of hard to change, um, harder definitely than what I'm going to present. Um, and it's sort of expensive to maintain because in the future you're going to have to keep changing this around. Um, if you ever want to adjust what Apalachi does for transition finding, you need to specifically address the case of fairness as well. What instead we can do is we can pre-process away these enabled predicates. Um, that has the advantage of whatever you decide to change in the intern in the transition execution, um, you're going to you're going to still be fine because these enabled um, because essentially fairness has been um, has been pre-processed away, and then that also allows you to use these enabled um, predicates outside of fairness. Right? If we would change the Apalachi internals. This would give us nothing for um, addressing enabled in our specs. And this, um, if we pre-process it away, then we can just handle it no matter where it appears. Okay, and I'll try to briefly go over what is done for this. So Apalachi has some symbolic transition finder that's quite, that's quite neat um, for sort of um, generating, that generates the symbolic transitions of our system, right? So this can help us also handling enabled. So Let's, um, let's take in some action here. Um, so Apalachi, the symbolic transition finder, it will split some action like this into some parts that relate to assignments and some parts that relate to conditions. So for example, these, um, these three lines here, uh, this, this, and this, they relate to some assignments. And the other parts for Apalachi are, um, are only conditions. What, what we can do is we can replace the assignments with true, right? Because to know whether an action is enabled, we don't need to, we don't need to respect the assignments. We just need to know whether it's enabled right now. It doesn't mean we have to take it. And the conditions, we can just replace them with the assignments, right? So if y must be, if y must be x prime plus five, well then if we have an assignment for x prime, then let's just plug that in, right? Um, so for, um, right, so in this case, we would get something like this, where um, we, sorry, we, we replace all the assignments with true. Um, so Apalachi rewrites this, yeah, Apalachi rewrites this set membership by this quantification. Um, and we're, we keep this essentially to 
check in a roundabout way whether this set is not empty. So there is a possible value that we could assign. Um, and then we put these we put these assignments instead of the primed variables. And then this preprocess in a very nice way. It uses Apalachi's symbolic transition finder to preprocess away these enabled. And if we ever see enabled, then we replace it by this neat description of when it actually is enabled. So to um, the last, ma the last uh, sort of major point, um, this is restricted to expressions that the symbolic transition finder can actually handle. So one example of an action that might not be handleable is something like this, where you say, oh, my action is going to be that, X, that y prime times y prime plus one is equal to zero. So there, we're not going to have much luck with finding out whether this is enabled or not. Um, just because Apalachi, in the end, goes back to an SMT solver that can have a hard time solving these things, right? OK. So to, to conclude, Apalachi supports arbitrary temporal properties now. Um, and temporal properties are transformed into invariants in some intermediate specification, but thanks mostly to history and prophecy variables. That might also be helpful if you have some complicated things you want to do with TLA+. Um, so thanks for listening. You can find on the left-hand side the, um, the page for Apalachi and for informal systems, and on the right-hand side, my page. And if you want to contact me, feel free. Thank <laughs> you.